And final part of this uh, this uh, discussion on welfare economics, uh, I will then uh, dive a little bit in more detail to the types of market failures uh, that where the environmental uh, problems are associated with. So um, in the previous lesson, uh, we discussed the types of market failures and we identified that uh, very often the uh, environmental problems are related to these three types of market failures. One relates to the property rights, uh, one is about externalities, and third one is, is the related to the public goods. So let's now take a more detailed look on each of these, uh, these three types of market failures. So if we clarify about them, different types of uh, types of property then from uh, from a legal perspective uh, it's it's good to uh, distinguish that okay if they do not have private property then uh, what other types of property there there can be and and uh, and uh, there we can we can we can use this kind of uh, four different types of um, uh, types of uh, property rights so firstly if you think about private property uh, in Latin, res privae, then in that case, then property is assigned uh, to some clearly identifiable individuals uh, who have control of access and, and rights to a socially acceptable use of this, uh, this property. So think about, for example, um, some, some uh, apartment for, for, for living in some kind of apartment building. So if you, if you own the apartment, uh, then you have control and access to the to the apartment. You can control who is uh, allowed to live in this apartment, who is allowed to enter, and and you can in principle do anything you want in with this your private property. But then there's also some kind of uh, um, can be rules about the socially acceptable uses. So for example, then you cannot uh, uh, make a lot of noise at night time, uh, or it's possible to to also make uh, make. Uh, um, uh, it's possible to disallow for example, smoking in the balcony or even smoking in the apartment might be might be not uh, not acceptable. So within this kind of limits of what is socially acceptable, uh, you can utilize the private property as you as you wish, and you can you have the control, you have the full control of this uh, this uh, that who is uh, who is then entering this this private property. Now, if if it is then not exactly private property, like uh, like uh, so, remember that in this uh, this uh, seven uh, conditions for the behind this uh, this um, uh, welfare welfare theorems, we assume that all property is private property, but but then there is also other types of uh, types of property than private property, and there's various degrees of this kind of property rights. So it's good to then draw a distinction of this non-private property what kind of types of property there might exist. So the second on the list is called common property in Latin res communes. So in this case, it's there is also clearly identified group of people who own this property and they have also right to exclude non-owners and then also duty of maintaining the property through constraints claims on, on use. So I mentioned this uh, this example of an apartment as a private property. So common property might be also similarly, uh, for example, uh, uh, some kind of laundry room in the in the apartment building, which is commonly used by the residents of the building, but uh, but it's not just for the individual owner. So so laundry room might be a, a good example of common property, which is restricted to the to the. Um, uh, residents of the building, but not, uh, and then they have also some way of of controlling access to this uh, to this uh, laundry room, and uh, and then in some sense there is also then then duty of maintaining the the laundry room in a, in a good condition, or if something doesn't function, then you inform the 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 maintenance or management of the of the company. Um, Another example might be, for example, some kind of uh, a parking lot for the apartment, maybe maybe some kind of guest parking. So, of course, you might have some individually uh, assigned parking lots, but you might have also some kind of common 
common parking parking uh, spots for the for for example for guest parking and then then of course there might come this kind of kind of some kind of common pool uh, problems already if you think about some kind of like uh, like if if the access to the parking lots is not uh, not restricted then then uh, then uh, some other people might uh, might leave their car there for a long time and kind of kind of there might be like uh, then then a shortage of the of the parking lots if there's not any kind of uh, um, restricted access to this kind of kind of common property so then then you might start to have then this kind of uh, kind of issues or if you have this common 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 laundry room there might be some kind of kind of uh, garbage left uh, or 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 it's not really really um, utilized in the manner that uh, that uh, that uh, following the instructions because then also it might be that uh, that there is not enough uh, supervision or 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 if you violate the conditions there is a very very uh, limited uh, supervision so common property might might then lead to to certain types of um, uh, violations of this kind of uh, uh, duties and and social norms. But then there is the third third type indicated here: the state property, the respublicae. So then, in that sense, it's it's similar to the common property, but the 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 number of owners is of course much larger. If if the all the citizens of the political entity, such as country. Then, uh, then uh, are in some sense owners of the of this um, of this property. So, for example, in here in Finland, uh, the the state owns uh, a large amount of of uh, forest. Uh, so there exist uh, state forests. But then, of course, the government can also then uh, then assign some some public agency uh, to to manage this kind of state property, and. Uh, and citizens have right to then use this resource. For example, in Finland, we can we can go to state-owned forest to to pick berries, on, and there's also also a possibility to do fishing or hunting and and this kind of activities, or just hiking in the in the nature. In fact, here in Finland, uh, um, we have the so-called everyman's rights uh, that allow us also to do this kind of activities in the private property. So even if land is privately owned. Uh, um, any citizen has right to uh, right to to um, especially concerning the forest land. So so even if it's privately owned forest, it's possible to pick up berries or mushrooms or do fishing or hunting in in privately owned forest as as well, which is something that uh, I believe is common in the Nordic countries, but not necessarily everywhere in the world. And. Uh, there, of course, in the case of state property, it might be also that uh, individual citizens are not respecting the state property as uh, and this property right of the state as much as it, it would be in the case of uh, private property. However, then the then the government has this kind of possibility to also enforce this kind of property rights by through some public agency who is managing this kind of uh, state property. So then. Uh, from the point of view of the environmental problems uh, and also this kind of uh, unsustainable use of uh, natural resources, the most problematic case is the open access resource. So, so very often uh, there may be some confusion between this kind of common property, state property and fully open access uh, property. So the open access, uh, you could call res nullius. So that, that means that there is absolutely no uh, no rules or rights assigned to 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 anything. So in some sense, it's like not 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 prop, not anybody's property. And uh, one good example is is for example this uh, um, international waters. Uh, so in in the in the seas and oceans, uh, there are there are regions that are not really. Uh, owned or governed by any 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 specific state, so there are just uh, just uh, there is not any specific property right, and this can also then then uh, um, lead to this kind of uh, abuse of the resources. For example, overfishing in the in the international waters because no government has the authority to to limit or control this kind of uh, abuse of this kind of open access access resource. This can be, of course, also in uh, 
in um, uh, countries where this kind of rule of the government is not uh, not um, uh, very very tight or is failed. Uh, so, for example, if you have some some country in the civil war or, or otherwise uh, uh, not not in the control of the government, you might have this kind of uh, problem with the open access uh, resources that uh, different parties are just uh, exploiting some kind of uh, kind of uh, natural resource. So this is maybe a useful distinction also that uh, in contrast to private property, there exist also different types of common state-owned and open access uh, access property, which is good to also, also understand that. And I, as I said, the open access is, of course, the most difficult situation to the, to the, to the uh, uh, related to the exploitation of natural resources and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, pollution problems as well. Okay, so then let's consider the second of this this uh, type of market failures related to the so-called externalities. So let us first uh, consider more specific uh, definition. What does externality really mean? So I took this uh, description from the textbook by Herman et al. So they characterize an externality or or in other words an external effect uh, um, that uh, that the externality is said to occur when the production or consumption decisions uh, of one agent have an impact on the utility or profit of another agent and uh, i highlighted in red color the following so it should be an unintended effect and then there is no compensation or payment made by the generator of the impact to the affected party. In fact, also the other way around. So this compensation and payment, of course, uh, refers to this cost theorem that, okay, there can be this kind of unintended uh, effect, but if it is compensated, so in that sense, then this, uh, this kind of effect becomes internalized if this compensation is paid. And according to the cost theorem, it doesn't really matter. Is it the generator pays the affected party? It could be also that the affected party pays the generator to, to reduce this kind of uh, impact. So if there is some kind of compensation or compensation mechanism has taken place, then we don't talk, talk about externality anymore. Then it, in that some sense, this, this kind of uh, harm has been internalized. Okay. And here the critical is also that it's an unintended way. So if uh, if uh, someone is making uh, harm on purpose, for example, to revenge some other other kind of uh, uh, behavior, then it's also not an externality if it is intentional uh, intentional harm. So when we talk about ex externalities, we refer to this kind of unintended effects which are not compensated. So very often we think about this externality in terms of uh, uh, environmental pollution, but there can be also, also other type of uh, externalities. So I also took from the permanent alt textbook this kind of uh, classification of, uh, of different types of externalities. And uh, it's good to first of all mention that, uh, that uh, externalities can be beneficial, but they can be also adverse. And then another is that they can originate in the consumption or they can originate in the production. So if you think about the um, externalities of consumption decisions, uh, then they can be, for example, beneficial externalities. Uh, and here is an example is uh, vaccination against an infectious disease, for example, a COVID vaccination. And uh, so what is here the external effect? Uh, one is that, of course, this uh, vaccination is supposed to protect uh, this uh, individual who gets this vaccination. But the external effect comes from the fact that uh, these vaccinated people are also then less likely to spread this infectious disease to others. So this is, for example, why it has been important that, uh, for example, nurses or other, other professionals in healthcare take this kind of vaccinations that they are not... Uh, uh, not spreading the disease to to the patients, but also 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 then then in 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 terms of for example vaccinating small children, 
that also prevents this kind of infectious uh, diseases uh, spreading in uh, in the daycare or schools. So this is this is what this kind of vaccination has this kind of beneficial externality in the case of infectious disease. So then, of course, there can be also adverse effects. So, so here is as an as an example from the consumption decision that, for example, a noise pollution from radio playing in park. So it might be that this uh, person listening to the radio is is enjoying this uh, this uh, uh, radio show uh, and and likes to likes to likes to listen to it with the volume that is uh, is. Uh, is um, suitable for this own 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 needs of the person. Perhaps this person has a bad hearing or something, but then it might be disturbing to other users of the park who would like to, for example, uh, listen to the to the birds singing or or listen to the uh, no sign whatsoever. They want to, for example, just be be enjoy the quiet in the park. So this this is an example of an adverse adverse effect. And in, in, in some sense, this doesn't have to be a park. It could be, for example, just noise pollution in an apartment building. So this kind of uh, adverse uh, adverse uh, impact of noise to the neighbors can be also another example of, uh, of an uh, adverse externality in the, in the consumption. But very often, of course, when we talk about externalities, we have in mind... Uh, externalities originating in the production. So of course, consumption is not the only source of uh, externalities, but it also can be can be in the production. And also in production side, there can be can be beneficial or adverse externalities. So as an example of um, of a beneficial externality, think about some some um, uh, some farms. So so there is this um, uh, pollination of blossom arising from proximity to apiary refers to a situation that uh, think about uh, there is some kind of um, let's say uh, apple trees on the front farm and the neighboring farm is is having uh, having uh, is growing bees to 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 produce honey. So so then this. Uh, this, of course, uh, they are mutually beneficial. So, so the bees are pollinating the apple trees, and and also this uh, this bee farmer would need this kind of kind of uh, kind of um, uh, flowers of of the apple trees to to so that these uh, these bees can make honey. So this would be beneficial to both parties uh, to have these these bees and apple trees. Uh, but then there is this kind of uh, situation that we uh, are very much concerned in this course is this kind of adverse effects originating in production. And uh, here is one example is a chemical factory discharging contaminated water into into water system. So we had this kind of similar kind of kind of uh, runoff of um, uh, runoff of nutrients to, to the river was one example in the previous lesson. Here is some kind of chemical discharge. So very often, of course, this kind of, when we think about uh, pollution, it is this kind of uh, adverse externality originating in production. Same, of course, uh, air pollution or, or, or discharge of uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And in that sense, this is the this is the type of uh, environmental problem that we will then discuss in the later later part of this course. But at this point, it's good to good to mention because uh, because we talked about this uh, uh, efficient allocation through through competitive markets. So whenever we have this kind of uh, either beneficial or adverse externalities then the competitive market doesn't necessarily lead to Pareto efficient uh, outcome. So the, the main, main rule is that if there is some kind of um, beneficial externalities, uh, the market mechanisms doesn't, doesn't produce enough of this kind of beneficial uh, externalities and uh, typically market mechanism leads to the too much production of adverse externalities. And this is because these individual firms and individual consumers, they don't take into account these external effects 
when they are making their own consumption decisions or own production decisions. So this is why there is too, uh, too much adverse externalities and too little beneficial externalities. And uh, again, it's good to remember this uh, uh, statement of the Coase theorem that, uh, that, of course, if this kind of property rights are, are, are well defined, then these kind of affected parties, they can also then, uh, then uh, negotiate and come up with a deal. So it would be easy, for example, if you had this kind of case of this, uh, these bees and, and apples. So if you have two farmers, one has uh, apple trees, another one has, uh, has uh, bees. So they could, for example, then, then coordinate the production that, okay, that, uh, that uh, you will get this benefit of, of uh, pollinating uh, bees and another one gets the benefit of, of producing honey. So, so they could kind of, kind of then, then um, uh, make some kind of agreement that they both, both can, can, uh, can have, a, have or coordinate this how many, how many trees and how many, how many bees they are, they are using. But then it becomes much more difficult when there's many, many affected, uh, affected parties. For example, this uh, vaccination uh, is much more difficult because then, then the number of uh, affected parties is much larger. That, that, that in some sense, it's the whole, whole population that uh, uh, enjoys this benefits of the, of the vaccination. And that's perhaps one reason that this kind of vaccination programs are, are often organized by the government organizations. So finally, let's also look into more in detail to this, um, these um, types of public goods and private, private goods. So previously we talked about, uh, about um, private versus public, but we did not really, really uh, uh, draw a distinction of what makes, uh, why, why some goods are private and why some goods are public. So now let's clarify that. And, and then there exists some kind of which we can think of intermediate cases between private, pure private and pure public goods. So there are two, two criteria that, 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 that need to be kept in mind. So one is, is obviously this kind of excludability. So can, can we exclude um, other people from consuming this, this good? So if, if it is possible to exclude then, then it's a, it more more likely to be a, a private good. If it's not excludable, then then it's more likely to be a, a public good. And then another aspect is that uh, this whether it's a rivalrous or non-rivalrous, meaning that uh, if if uh, if I enjoy the good, then uh, then it's away from you. And then it is a rivalrous good. If if there is uh, is uh, if my consumption doesn't limit or, or influence your ability to to enjoy this good, then it's a non-rivalrous. So here is four examples of, of, of classified in these two two categories. So as an example of a pure private good in this table adopted from the from the permanent alt textbook again. So as an example of pure private good, there is ice cream. So it's rivalrous in the sense that if I eat the ice cream, then there's less available for you. And it's excludable. If I own the ice cream, I, I don't have to share it with anyone. I can just eat, eat it myself. Now, then if you, if you continue with this excludable good, but, but then take an example of non-rivalrous uh, good. So there is this kind of, we can talk about congestible resources. And here is an example is wilderness area. Think about some kind of like like uh, um, like uh, nature reserve or or, or, or nature park. Uh, so it's uh, if if it is some kind of like a large enough uh, large enough uh, forest area, for example, it's non rivalrous in the sense that I can go to enjoy the forest and there is uh, there is enough space for for you to enjoy it as well. We don't need to even meet in this if it is big enough big enough forest. However, it's excludable. It's possible to build some kind of fence around this uh, this uh, this wilderness, and it's possible, for example, for some like some state agency to control control entry to this kind of kind of area. So, therefore, it is possible to exclude 
or, or give some kind of entry rights who can access this resource. And it's congestible, meaning that if, if there is too many people entering this uh, this this uh, uh, this uh, nature reserve, then then it can become already problematic. It, it can be some damage to the environment. That can be can be uh, uh, it it already starts to to uh, decrease the enjoyment of this kind of kind of nature. So if if it is too congested. So, so in principle, it's 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 uh, excludable. It doesn't have to be in practice excluded, but at least in principle, uh, some kind of nature nature park it can be can be uh, control can be uh, made on this uh, entry, but but it's not necessarily rivalry. So this is like like uh, like um, referred to as a congestible resource. So, so then we can then we can also then then uh, move to the to the right uh, column of these non-excludable resources. So there is this kind of example of a rivalrous non-excludable resource is an ocean fishery that I already mentioned. This kind of ocean fishery outside of territorial water. So this was an example of an open access resource, and because there is not any kind of uh, uh, a government control or, or, or property right assigned to this. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, you cannot exclude anybody from entering this kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, ocean fishery. But it is rivalrous in the sense that if if uh, uh, if um, one vessel is catching the fish, then other is away from the other other vessels. And uh, in the most extreme, of course, it might lead to the extinction of the of the fish in that area. And then the fourth category, if you have a goods that are non-excludable and, and non-rivalrous, there is this uh, example of national defense that is, uh, is the most uh, perhaps purest example of, of public good. So that meaning that, uh, that, uh, that non-excludability means that, uh, that uh, um, if, there is a, if, if there is an um, army that is... Uh, that is uh, uh, protecting certain uh, citizens of a nation, then it's not possible to exclude some of the citizens uh, from this uh, uh, umbrella of nat national defense. So, it, in some sense, then the the, the military is then protecting the entire entire nation. Of course, it's possible to exclude, and uh, it, it sometimes it's limited to the uh, certain geographic area. So, it of course it doesn't doesn't protect every every other other country. But anyway, within that 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 state, it is non-excludable. So you cannot uh, cannot uh, limit uh, any any group within that state outside of the national defense. And then it's also non-rivalrous, so that uh, that uh, if one individual is protected by the national defense, uh, uh, it doesn't then limit uh, the protection from others. So everybody, in some sense, get the same same degree of national national defense so i believe this kind of classification based on excludability and rivalry uh, is uh, is helping to to understand this uh, this uh, uh, different degrees of, of whether some are, are private goods and 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 public goods and there exist this kind of intermediate uh, uh, intermediate cases and then, of course, it also also then relates to this uh, property rights that I started with. That, of course, if we have this kind of pure private goods, it's also then uh, easier or perhaps even more necessary to assign some kind of property right to this uh, uh, to this kind of goods. If we have this kind of public goods, then uh, it is more difficult to assign some kind of private property rights to to something like uh, law enforcement or 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 uh, or national defense so this also illustrates that that sometimes these kind of property rights but also externalities and public goods they are also very closely related and and uh, and in that sense it's useful to understand also that uh, what is the nature of the of the goods that we are talking about are they are they private or public are they uh, and and what what kind of externality problems then then might might result from from that 
Good. So this completes the my discussion of the of the welfare economics in this course. Uh, as the next topic, we will go to the um, pollution control, and I will start by by drawing more clear distinction between the so-called stock pollutants and flow pollutants. See you next time. Bye bye.